morning, everyone. I'm Nick Honeyset, and I'm from the internet. And I'm going to talk to you today about our future, our enchanted future. This is going to be a wild technology ride, so sit back, strap yourself in, and please keep your hands and feet inside the carriage at all times. I have the great good fortune to work in a space between uh, audiences, inappropriately characterized here by a group of minions, <laughs> and the collection objects that we have, the exhibitions and events that we program, and the performances uh, that we stage. It's called audience engagement, but it's a much more exciting and magical place. The happiest place on earth. So before we get to that, why am I here? You're probably asking yourself the same thing. I work for an organization called the Balboa Park Online Collaborative. See, I am literally from the internet. And I work in San Diego's Balboa Park. It is a collaboration of 27 cultural institutions uh, brought together by the Balboa Park Cultural Partnership. 17 of those 27 institutions are museums and they have a single pass to get, them, uh, to get folks into the institutions. It's called the Explorer Pass, and we provide, uh, among a whole bunch of other things, uh, a web layer in, uh, interface to that. So that's why I'm here. So we're going to talk about technology, and you're going to see lots of technology in this presentation. If your technology isn't in this presentation, I humbly apologize. If it is, give me a whoop out. So, I'm going to share with you my favorite quote about technology. It's from the movie The Terminator, and I've changed one word from that quote. Listen and understand. I'm going to change the word. That technology is out there. It can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear. And it absolutely will not stop ever until you are dead. As you're about to see, technology is an unstoppable force, so I encourage you to embrace these things wholeheartedly. But first, I wanted to characterize some of the things you're going to see uh, as kind of societal trends and uh, engagement trends. Mobile. It's a trend now, and I don't mean having just a mobile device. I mean the whole concept of consuming content wherever you are, whenever you want to. A personalized experience. People are demanding a personalized experience. Even drinking a Coke nowadays is a personal experience. What about this expectation of participation? Well, I'm blaming television. Television used to be this highly curated, highly packaged experience. Now it is infinitely participatory. It's crowd curated, it's crowd sourced, and the audience can actually participate in the whole experience. That's what our audiences are coming to see us. That's their expectation. And also control. If you have a teenage daughter and you try and call her on her mobile phone and she doesn't answer it but texts you immediately back, it's because she wants to control the conversation. <laughs> I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> so let's get into some technology. Gestural interfaces. Touchscreens have been uh, the backbone of engagement technology in museums for a long time, but it's been presenting somewhat of a problem, uh, which is solved by this transparent touchscreen. This solves the problem that educators and curators have when there's technology in the galleries, people want to look at the technology and not look at the actual objects. This transparent touchscreen with a gestural interface is directly in front and does not obscure this collection object from you. Now, transparent touchscreens are literally regular touchscreens costing twice as much with just the back ripped off. <laughs> it's true. Here's the Cleveland Museum of Art with two fascinating and engaging experiences around their collection objects. This is a game where you pose in front of a uh, image recognition uh, device and it tries to match the statue. You, you try and match your pose to the statue that you're seeing. And then this one, you pull a face and the system tries to match you, the face that you're pulling with collection objects and statues. Look how much fun those people are having. Do you think they'd be having that much fun if they were standing passively in front of an object? I don't think so. I've been there, and alarmingly, I look like a Buddha when I'm looking at my mobile phone. <laughs> it's true. Two more examples. 
one from the Royal Ontario Museum and the Meld museum Media. The also hired Meld Media to produce a set of interactive murals, taking illustrations that have been prepared by paleontologists and transforming them into animated projections, large enough to take over entire hallways, so that it feels as if you're traveling back through time as you walk down them. With an added Xbox 360 Kinect controller, these murals are made interactive. The dinosaurs notice that you're there and actually turn their heads to follow you as you pass by. Another example from the Cleveland Museum of Art. This system is doing visual recognition, it's figuring out where you are looking, and it's providing you with a magnifying glass on that area. And if two people look at the same place, the magnifying glass doubles in size. Amazing. Close looking, a challenge for many curators and educators with regard to collection objects. Creative coding. Did you know there are no longer computer programmers? There are creative coders. And it's about expression and not function. And these are the devices that they're using. You may have heard the terms Raspberry Pi and Arduino. These tiny computers costing a few tens of dollars are immensely powerful and you can use them to do some amazing things. Down in San Diego at the Old Globe Theater, we tricked out these prop chairs so that it, they know when you sit in them and they recite lines from the play that they were in. Right? Or what about this example from the Museum of Old and New Art in Tasmania? You can hook these devices up to the internet, you can get them to control this exhibit, and you can send them texts. And these devices turn those texts and those messages into words made out of water droplets. Imagine the future of listening to the news in the shower. <laughs> What's next? Augmented reality. I've been to a couple of sessions. There's a lot of talk about augmented reality. Uh, nobody got away without mentioning Pokemon Go which has been hugely successful in the museum space, accounting in many instances for a 50% increase in attendance for people trying to get in to capture uh, a Pokemon. Uh, I myself in Balboa Park on our Wi-Fi have seen a 100% increase in Wi-Fi activity since July 6 when Pokemon Go launched. So let's talk about augmented reality in space, in the museum space. Here's a typical situation. This one is the San Diego Museum of Art and simply add some technology, technology company, and some augmented reality, and this is what you get. A moment of zen. How much longer would you stand in front of that work of art if it was doing that? Uh, and does it look familiar? totally stolen from Harry Potter. <laughs> what about natural languages? All these global technology companies are getting into the natural language processing business, trying to understand from a computer standpoint what we're saying. You may be familiar with the Alexa device from Amazon. It's a device that understands uh, your commands, and she will do anything for you. Search the internet, tell you jokes, turn the lights on, open the front door, open the garage. Projecting this into the future, really intelligence is going to become a utility. Think about hard disk storage. It's a utility now. Intelligence is going the same way. You may be able to buy intelligence by the IQ point. So let's see how that's being utilized. First, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with holograms. This performance by Tupac Shakur with Snoop Dogg uh, several years after his uh, death. And also coming to Las Vegas at a stage near you are holographic performances by Buddy Holly and Liberace. But what about this in the cultural setting? Let me introduce you to Pinkas Gutta. Pinkas Gutta is a Holocaust survivor. He was put in front of a green screen and surrounded by cameras and video cameras, and he was asked thousands upon thousands of questions. A team of researchers puts an artificial intelligence layer over that to create this experience in the classroom. My name is Pinchas Guter. I will answer any questions you might have for me. How old were you when the war ended? 
I was between the ages of 13 and 14 when the war ended in 1945. Do you remember any songs from your youth? This is a lullaby that my mother used to sing to me and I still remember it. It's in Polish. Oral histories used to be a scratchy tape, cassette tape. This is what they're turning into. Virtual reality. We've had a lot of talk about virtual reality at this uh, conference too. Anyone who's been to the Louvre and uh, tried to look at the Mona Lisa, this is the Mona Lisa room, uh, it is an absolute zoo. But not so in virtual reality. Comes with wine, <laughs> chamber music, it's a very peaceful experience. And the irony is that the Mona Lisa is actually behind bulletproof glass, so actually when you get there, she looks like she's on a computer monitor screen anyway. <laughs> this is the lonely experience and reality of virtual reality, unless you are the Sydney Dance Company partnering with the Australian moving, uh, Centre for the Moving Image. It's a sort of part documentary, part dance, part drama, sort of film in which you appear on stage with, with Sydney Dance Company and you kind of interrogate them about being a dancer and about being a performer and sort of by, as the, as the work evolves, you actually become a part of the, the performance itself. Leave it to a dance company to create collaboration in virtual reality. 3D projection mapping. You may be familiar with 3D projection mapping, certainly on the building scale, where you computerize uh, the structure of a, an architecture and you project movement and some absolutely amazing things. You may well have seen this. But what about in the cultural context? Well, this is something similar, uh, breathing life into sculpture, and I present you another moment of zen. Beautiful and scary at the same time, <laughs> and, and probably the subject of many nightmares for young children. <laughs> Remote control. You may have seen one of these devices. Uh, there are various models out there. This is a telepresence device. Uh, we're partnering with the San Diego Air and Space Museum, and this is a robot. And you can control it remotely over the internet, and you can hear and see um, and move around. And I have a short clip from the San Diego Museum of Art here. And really, this is designed for schools who, certainly the way we're using it, for schools who don't have the funds to bring kids on a field trip into the museum, they can do it from their classroom. And listen out as I play this clip for the excitement going on in the classroom. Can you guys all see it? So that's one way of solving it. What else can you do? You can actually see a little video of it flying. We're going to take you to this airplane. Follow me. This is so and no chewing gum stuck on collection objects. <laughs> but what really we're training our kids to do is to give them the expectation that they can go anywhere, do anything, and control everything. Those kids are going to be grown-ups, <laughs> maybe, one day. The holodeck, oh yeah. It's real. It's coming to a museum near you. If you're a TED fan, you may have seen this uh, video. I have a short clip from it of Alex Kipman talking about the future uh, of holograms. That Dr. Jeffrey Norris from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Fingers crossed. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Alex. Whew, that worked. How are you doing today, Jeff? Doing great. I've had an awesome week. So can you tell us a little bit, Jeff, about where you are? Well, I'm actually in three places. I'm standing in a room across the street while I'm standing on the stage with you while I'm standing on Mars, 100 million miles away. I'm just going to 
melodramatic pause while that sinks in. He's in three places. He's on the stage, he's across the street, and he's on Mars 100 million miles away. Vision, remote vision at a distance. If only we could manipulate at a distance. Oh yeah, they have that too. MIT Media Lab and their ten tangible media group. Pretty amazing. Put those two things together in the future. These are nascent technologies. Think what they're going to be like in five, ten years' time. And they actually remind me of a quote by Einstein. I'm a recovering physicist. And it's true. Uh, but Einstein had an observation about quantum mechanics, which is spooky action at a distance. And that exactly reminds me of putting those two things together and what we can accomplish. With all this engagement technology, there are naysayers. And this is an often heard complaint that I receive about nobody reading anymore. Half the kids can't even do joined up writing anymore. But I want to present to you a concept called the Gutenberg parenthesis. I know it's a little early in the morning for this, but it basically says that evolutionarily speaking, we've learned, we've understood, we've engaged using oral, visual, shared, remixed storytelling and collaborative experiences. That's how we're designed. And it's only really the last 500 years that that's changed, where our way, modes of learning have been textual, linear, permanent, authored one way, and a kind of a broadcast mode. Indeed, only uh, mass literacy has only been, really been around for 100 years. And it may actually go away. Because with all these things, we're actually getting back to the evolutionary way of understanding and learning. It's oral and visual, it's shared and remixed, it's collaborative and conversational, and it's about storytelling and experiences. A little deep for the morning. I apologize. But this is my big finish. Time is up. Um, I have a prediction for the future. Reality won't be what it used to be. But nothing compares to the real thing, and that's a really important message. And in fact, I think experience of the real thing, and we're seeing anecdotal evidence and real evidence of this already, the real thing will become more significant and more desirable. And to illustrate that point, I'm going to introduce you to Moon Rebus, who has a device implanted in her arm that is connected to the US Geographical Earthquake Surveying Detection System. And every time there's an earthquake, her arm vibrates. I am not making this up. But it gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, Intel Inside. <laughs> There's a video about her. So I started with audiences, and I'll finish with audiences. This whole strategy, your digital strategy around engagement, is really about the audiences. And it's helping them move and transform them from this kind of passive experience to something much more exciting. Thank you. So I'm going to do a Steve Jobs on you and say there's one more thing. Uh, I wanted to share with you a clip uh, which is what, what I consider to be the best example of virtual reality out there. And it's from an organization called Magic Leap. Wow. Thank you. <laughs>